Jesus' name. Amen? All right, you guys. So we've been in the life of Abraham. Probably many of you haven't been exactly with us, but I'll just catch you up a little bit. Chapter 18, um, Abraham, uh, at the beginning, he was... Uh, he welcomed, really, three visitors, very interesting characters. Uh, one of them, we find out, was the Lord. The word used there in Hebrew is Adonai or Yahweh, so it's the Lord. And the other two are probably angels. And we saw Abraham say, please don't just pass by my tent, stay here. And so he prepared a place for them to stay. He made them a big meal. And then once again, the Lord drops on him the information that uh, they're going to have children. And, and uh, so we talked about that last time. Now, as we pick this up, these three visitors, one of them is the Lord, are finishing up the meal and uh, they're ready to go. So we are going to pick it up in verse 16. And it says this, the men got up from there. And they looked out over Sodom, and Abraham was walking with them to see them off. Just let me just a little bit paint a picture here. Remember at the beginning of the chapter, we were told that Abraham is sitting in front of his tent. So it's not like he's got a big house with a white picket fence, and he's sort of walking them to the gate and opening it up and saying, see, you guys. It's not like that. It's probably just open land, and, and Abraham is going to walk these guys to bid them farewell. He's going for a ways, apparently on top of a hill or something, because we're told that they can see Sodom. Um, what we're about to read in, in uh, chapter 19 uh, in May is that Sodom and Gomorrah are going to go down. And uh, they are pretty bad places. We'll talk about that a little bit. But um, So they can see these places. It's also, I think, interesting to notice that... Um, Sodom and Gomorrah were sort of like resort towns. These were places like maybe what we would call Las Vegas or, or maybe, uh, I don't know, Telluride. <laughs> People with money would come and they'd sort of, that was the party places to go. It was very carnal places. And, and so they go to this place where they can see uh, the, the city here. I remember when I was in Jerusalem in 2017, I got to go up on the Mount of Olives, and on, it was a really clear day. You could see the entire city of Jerusalem from up there. It was really awesome. And actually, you could even see an hour drive away, you could see Tel Aviv way out there. And it was just awesome. Then you turn around, you see the, the wilderness behind it where John the Baptist was, and it was such a neat thing. And that's sort of what I'm picturing here. Abraham's walking these guys up, and they're looking at these two cities, or, and... and, and God is about to drop some information about what's going to go down in these places. Verse 17. Then the Lord said, should I hide what I am about to do from Abraham? I'm imagining that the Lord is speaking to these other two guys, uh, probably angels, and he's saying, should I hide what I'm about to do for, from Abraham? Verse 18. Abraham is to become a great and powerful nation, and all the nations of the earth will be blessed through him. For I have chosen him so that he will command his children and his house after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what's right and just. This is how the Lord will fulfill to Abraham what he promised him. Now, I think, just stop here. I think this is kind of interesting because the Lord's talking to these other angels or whatever, and he's saying, um, like, should I hide what I'm a, what's about to go down, what are, where I'm going, what I'm about to do? This revelation that I'm going, you know, should I hide this from Abraham? And the answer is, no, I don't think I should hide it from Abraham. And then he tells us why. He says, because Abraham is going to be the father of all these nations. Basically this, it's because Abraham is going to be a man of influence. And I was reading this and I'm thinking, you know what? This is a big time principle of God's word that I think we should grasp today. So please hear this, okay? Don't be too distracted. Please hear this. Um, God saves his revelation for those who will share it. Does that make sense? Here he's like, he's going to be the father of nations. He's going to pass it on to his children what, to, to, to do what's right, to do what's just. And you know, sometimes I'll hear people and they'll say, man, I, you know, I've been reading the Bible in the mornings and I'm trying to get into it and everything, but it's like I don't get anything out of it and it seems like it doesn't really speak to me or whatever. I don't know what's going on. Could it be that maybe you're not receiving a lot of revelation from the Lord because when he does reveal something to you, you keep it to yourself and you don't share it? Does it make sense? 
And then I've been going to church forever and I've heard all these sermons and to be honest with you, they're really boring and I'm not really getting anything out of it. Yeah, because it's going in one ear, out the other. You know, we, you and I were made to be conduits. We were made for God to pour something in and then for it to flow out to the world around us. Amen? The folks you live with, the folks you work with, the things that God's speaking to your heart, it's okay to share those with other people. As a matter of fact, I believe that when God sees that his people are sharing the things that he's sharing with them, he will reveal even more. Does that make sense? It's a big time principle. So if you're kind of in that place, you're like, man, I just don't feel like I've been really hearing anything new from the Lord. Begin to share what God's speaking to you now. Amen? Does that make sense? All right. I just love that. Um, Got to share it. So we ended it. Uh, let's go to verse 20. So then the Lord said, so he's like, should I do it? I'm going to do it. Here we go. Verse 20. Then the Lord said to Abraham, he's talking, the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah, these two cities, is immense, and their sin is extremely serious. I will go down, and I want to stop here for a minute. The way this is worded, it's as if the, the cities themselves are crying out to the Lord. There's not like, it's not like people in the cities are praying and crying out to the Lord. It's the cities themselves because the sin has gotten out of hand. It is, it is immense is the word that's used in this translation. I like that. It is, he says, extremely wicked. And so God says, I'm going down. Like it's going down and I'm going down. I was thinking about that because I believe that the Sodom and Gomorrah-like outcry of our generation is going to cause the Lord to come down again. He is, we call it the second coming, and uh, I really pray that the pre-tribulational people are right, <laughs> and we're not here. I can't imagine us being here for the wrath of God for sure, but... Whatever, people always say, are you pre-trib, post-trib, mid-trib, pan-trib? I'm like, I'm pan-trib. It'll all pan out in the end, you know? I just trust the Lord. But regardless of whatever your belief is, I don't really like to argue with people. Um, the Lord's coming back, and he's going to take names. He's going to deal. And actually, you know what? I'm going to turn. Luke chapter 17. You got to read this. And I'm going to start in verse... 29, uh, if I can find it, there it is. But on the day Lot left Sodom, uh, Sodom, fire and sulfur rained from heaven. So that's about to happen uh, in our text, from heaven and destroyed them all. Look at verse 30. It will be like that on the day the Son of Man is revealed. It's going to be like that. So What's going to cause God to come back? Listen, the wickedness of our generation. I don't know if you guys have felt it or not. Do you feel the darkness? Yes. That is, that is not, it's not just taking our little town. It, I mean, it's all over. Just the, the agendas that are so anti-God that are being pushed down our children's throats and in, our, in the school systems. And it's amazing. And, and I honestly, I get to the point where I'm going, God, seriously? Like how much longer? And I heard a wiser person than me once say, if God waits much longer, he needs to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. <laughs> we live in bad times, wicked times, dark times, where a bunch of weirdos like us that gather together in the name of Jesus to worship him and study his word and, and advance his kingdom are totally the minority. Amen? So God says, I'm coming down. Because of the immense wickedness, I just want to remind you, he's coming down again. I believe the day, matter of fact, Matthew chapter 24, Jesus is describing, and he says, you know, no one knows the day or time, but, but you know what? You can look at the, at the signs. You can look at, at the, the sky like a sailor would look at the sky, and he knows there's a storm coming. You can look, and gang, I mean, unless you're blind, <laughs> he's got to come quick. Amen? Maranatha, Lord, come quick. Take me out of this before tax day. That'd be awesome. <laughs> All right, just kidding, Lord. All right, so he says, uh, where was, oh, 21. So he says, I'm, I will go down to see if what they have done justifies the cry that has come up to me. If not, I'll find out. 
Well, the men turned from there, these other two angels or whatever, and they went towards Sodom while Abraham remained standing before uh, the Lord. Wow. I like that. He's standing there. I think this shows the grace of God. I think what God's saying to Abraham here is like, listen, I don't just act spur of the moment. I don't just, you know, well, today I feel like smiting you. Pooh. I'm taking out Sodom and Gomorrah. They're gone. God is telling Abraham here, I'm going to go down and I'm going to investigate. I'm going to see if the cries that I'm hearing are really, if it's really bad. If it's not, then fine. But if it is, things are going down. The grace of God, and you can see it here if you look. You know, the Bible tells us that God is slow to anger, right? He's quick to forgive, especially when people repent. Amen? The Bible tells us in the New Testament that God wishes that none would perish, but that all, right, would find him and get life, like real life. This is what God wants. So I love this. They hear God saying, I'm going to go down. I'm going to investigate. It's not like God's going, well, it's time just to wipe everybody out. I love that. You know, we have a gracious God. Listen, one of the reasons we gather together and study the Bible like this together, because the more we learn about the character of this God, the more, hopefully, we fall in love with him. So that's why I like to point things like that out. Do you see the grace of God here? He's being slow. How cool is that? Aren't you glad God is slow in your life when you jack up? I am. Thank you, Lord, for not being quick. You know, the first time I make a mistake or maybe I make a lot of mistakes and go, I shall smite thee, Michael. Thank you, Lord, for not doing that. I'm gonna go investigate. So anyway, let's keep going here. Verse uh, 23. So he, the, the two guys leave. The Lord's standing there. Abraham's standing there. Verse 23, look at this. Abraham stepped forward. The older translations say Abraham drew near to the Lord. I love that. So the Lord stays, the other two guys book, and, and, uh, and Abraham stands there. He's kind of walked him to the edge of the hill or whatever. And then, I'm, in my mind, I'm, picture, picture this. He steps up there. He draws near to the Lord. James, I don't have it up here, but um, James 4, 7 and 8 says something like this. I'm going to try to quote it. But if you resist the devil, he will flee. But if you draw near to the Lord, he will draw near to you. I love that verse, right? Come near to God. So Abraham steps forward. He draws near. And what happens in that intimate uh, setting? What happened? God says to him, uh, I'm sorry, Abraham says to him in that place, will you really sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Verse 24, what if there are 50 righteous people in the city? And we're about to go into a very famous passage of scripture where Abraham has got to be the boldest dude in all the Bible, He's about to like basically barter with the Lord and actually change his mind, which is nuts to think about. And so anyway, this is a crazy, this is like we read this stuff. Think think about it. He just steps forward right in his face. You know, he's like, really? You're going to take out the whole city. What if there's 50 people? So anyway, sorry. Sweep away, verse 24. What if there are 50 righteous people in the city? Will you really sweep it away instead of sparing the place for the sake of the 50 righteous people who are in it? You could not possibly do such a thing to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked the same or alike. You could not possibly do that. Notice the exclamation point. So just to wake everybody up, this is like him going, you cannot possibly do that. Little T.D. Jakes action for you there. You can't do it. This is what he's saying to the Lord right in his face. And then he says a very famous line. It's a hallmark verse. If you underline verses, this is one that should be underlined. Won't the judge of the whole earth do what is just? By the way, the answer to that question that many people are asking today. If God's so good, then how could he send anybody to hell? We have pastors behind pulpits all over America that are preaching, you know, this message. Well, God's real loving, and he's gracious, and he's good, and they're lovey-dovey and everything, and, 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 but the, we're not talking about hell. We're not talking about the consequences of, remo- of, of uh, rejecting the Lord, right? And, and, because, and the idea is, well, if God's so good, then he could never send someone to this old yucky place called hell. Never he would ever do that. 
If he's just, if he's fair, would he, why would he allow this person to die or my mom to suffer or all these things? People are asking this same question. Let me ask, tell you what the answer to the question is. Won't the God of all the judge, the, the, judge of, all, of the whole earth do what is just, do what is right, do what is fair? The answer is yes. God will always do what's right. He'll always do what's fair, gang. And here's the problem. I don't always agree with God. Like if he would just check in with me, I could tell him how he should do his deal. But he doesn't check with me. And you know why he doesn't check with me, he doesn't check with you? It's because God sees the whole picture, gang. Like he sees the beginning from the end. He sees the whole deal. And I don't. I have tunnel vision, man. I'm seeing this situation right here. And I wonder sometimes, and I'm like, God, I think you need to do this, and this is what I would do, and this is what I need you to do, Lord. And God's going, yeah, Michael, um, chill out, buddy. Just chill. Take a deep breath. I'm in control, and I'm just, and I'm fair, and I'm good. Yeah, but, but won't the judge of all the earth? Come on, you got to do what's right. And there's another thing you hear people say today. They'll say, well, what about... Um, what about the people that have never heard about Jesus? Like they're in the middle of some continent far away and no one's ever told them about Jesus and they die. You know, I mean, if God's so fair and God's so just, would you going to send those people to hell, Pastor Michael? I mean, come on, that's not fair. And, and to those people, I always say, you know, I believe that God has revealed himself to every human being on the planet. I really do. Matter of fact, Paul, the apostle, he wrote to a church in Rome in chapters one and two of Romans, you can read it later. But he tells you, he goes, every person within them, they have the knowledge that there's a creator, that there's a God. And by two ways, by the creation that is around about them, they can look around and there's something that'll tell them that there's a God. And by the conscience that's within them. So the truth of the matter is, I don't care what atheist you talk to, they will stand before the Lord. And the Bible tells us every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is the boss. Every single knee. Everybody, because no one's going to have an excuse. You know, Jesus said in John chapter 14, 6, right, famous, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one gets to this father of mine unless he goes through moi. That's the French version. <laughs> Peter's, Peter's preaching, right, this sermon in Acts chapter four, and, and he says, there is no other name under heaven that's been given to people by which people can be saved. Like, well, yeah, I mean, I think all, you know, as long as you're a good person, all paths sort of lead to the same thing, and as long as you're good and, and you know, you don't do drugs. No, no other name, no Confucius, no Buddha, no Shirley MacLaine. <laughs> Jesus. Well, that just seems really arrogant, and, and I just don't, you know, that just doesn't seem very fair. The judge of all the earth, let me tell you something. He is fair, he is just, and he has given people a way to know him. Every, every person, I believe. Amen? You with me? So let's keep going here. Uh, by the way, I want to say this to you. I got to turn to it. Um, it's the last book of the Bible, Revelation. Let me tell you why I know it's going to be fair for every single person, and I'm going to prove it to you right now. In Revelation chapter 19, I'll start in verse 1. This is the end of everything, right? After this, I heard something like the loud voice of a vast multitude in heaven saying this, Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Salvation, glory, and power belong to our God. Listen to this. Because his judgments are true and righteous. This vast majority of people that are hanging out in heaven, that are praising God, screaming, hallelujah, and that are saying his judgments are righteous and true, they're perfect, in other, in other words. This is everybody saying this. So the judge of the whole earth, gang, is fair. You guys with me still? Now, now, let me just be honest with you. We go on here the rest of the chapter, and just for sake of time, I'm, I'm just going to tell you what it says. So Abraham just keeps being bold. And he's like, oh, okay. And God says, hey, I'm not going to do this for, you know, I, I'll save the cities if there's 50 righteous people. And then Abraham says, well, what if there was just five less than that? What if there was 45? And God's like, yeah, I, I'll save it if there's 45. 
And then Abraham's like, well, listen, I know I'm dust. I'm just nothing. I'm just ashes here. But um, what if there was 40? And God's like, yeah, no, I'll, I'll say, it. yeah, sure. We'll save it if there's 40 righteous people. Okay, listen, I know this is asking a lot. Um, what if there's 30? And God's like, yes, I'll save it if there's 30. What if there's 20? Yes, okay, I'll do that. If there's 20. What if there's 10? What if there's 10 righteous people? God's like, yes, I will, I will not destroy the city if I find 10 righteous people. Abraham stops at 10 and bolts end of chapter, Okay. So that's pretty much it. 50, 45, 40, 30, 20, 10. Okay, God's like, yep, I'll save it. Now I'm wondering why Abraham stopped at 10. You know, but again, we're seeing the grace of God. If I can find a remnant there of 10. But, it, but we find out in chapter 19 that Abram's got a few daughters. He's got two daughters that are unmarried, two that are apparently married. So if you count, uh, oh, I'm sorry, not him, Lot, uh, his nephew. It's like Abraham really cares about Lot. You know, I don't know, I, this is what I'm thinking. I don't know if, if Abraham so much cares for these two cities as much as he cares for his nephew Lot and his family. We remember, if, if you've if you been with us in chapter 14, Abraham got an army together when his nephew got kidnapped and he went after and rescued him. So we know that Abraham cares about Lot. But when he gets to this place, we know that in chapter 19, Lot has two daughters, he's got a wife, and then he's got two other daughters and two sons-in-law. So that's eight, if I do my math right. So I'm wondering why Abraham didn't say, well, what about if there's eight? But maybe he thought to himself, yeah, my family's righteous, but there's got to be two other people, like maybe one per city that we can do, Lord. There's going to be, that's fine. Let's just call it a day. I've bugged you enough. I don't know what it is. Now, what we find out is that even the two married daughters don't go with him and, and just his wife, who's a really salty woman, and his two uh, unmarried daughters, that was a joke, Come on, you get that. Some of you, you'll read it ahead. Um, they end up going. Four. Four people go. That's it. Went all the way down to four. And God did destroy the cities, but he got them out of there, which is pretty cool. Again, the grace of God. Looking for a remnant. You know, oftentimes when I, I hear of the wickedness that surrounds us, um, I pray, Lord, uh, what are you going to do? And I, I remember this story, down to four. Is there a remnant? Are there people calling out my name, crying out for me, that believe in me, that are righteous and just? God saves. Amen? Which is good. <laughs> I love that. Anyway, let's keep going. You know, by the way, won't the judge of the whole earth do what is just? When I hear that, that, uh, that title, we, we talked a lot lately, We've, I've preached a message called El Shaddai, all the different names of the Lord, El Roy, the God who sees, and we talk about he, he's the vine, he is the, um, the gate, he's the door, he's the good shepherd, and we have all these names, Alpha, Omega, Beginning, End, um, all these awesome names for our God. One of them is the judge of the whole earth, and I got to be honest with you, if I'm listing my favorite names, this one's kind of towards the bottom, because when I hear judge... I get a little nervous. I don't know about you. The judge. You guys remember uh, laughing? Here comes the judge. Anybody? Come on. Everybody over 90 just raised their hand. Praise the Lord. All right. <laughs> just kidding, everybody. Um, yeah, anyway, so when I hear judge, I think, okay, and, and, and I wonder, is there supposed to be like this intimidation, this fear when we think of God? You know, Psalm 111 uh, says the famous verse, right? That the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, of us being smart. Like if you want to be smart, let me tell you how it starts. It's really good. Fear God. And, I, and you read that and you're like, what does that mean? Am I supposed to walk around and, you know, God, man, God, today I hope I don't mess up. I, I don't want to uh, displease you. I want to gain your approval. And, and, and what am I supposed to do here? I better get it right. And I'm not necessarily sure that that's what it is. I've heard lots of sermons about what the fear of the Lord is. Well, what he's talking about there is our good reverence. It's revering the Lord. And I got to be honest with you, I don't use the word revere and reverence in my language. I don't go to Clark's and be like, hey, there's, I revere you. Thank you for checking me out. You know, I just don't talk like that. So what does revere mean? Well, it's just being, is it really being afraid? And what does God expect of us? What does he want? And here's the thing. I think within all of us, gang, there is a desire to want to impress others. 
There's something in me that wants a pat on the back when I do something good. I want to go out on the porch, and, and the church I grew up in, we used to do that. The, the pastor would end the sermon, and then they would do a song at the end, and the pastor would go out on the porch, and he'd shake everybody's hand. And everybody pretty much said the same thing. Oh, that was a good message today. That was great. And he'd be like, yeah, well, praise the Lord. And he would do that, and, and then at the end, he'd feel all great. And so I told Kelly, I want to do that. I want people to tell me it was awesome. Right? Because there's something in me that wants to impress you. I want to gain God's approval. I want people to like me. And I want God to like me. You know, the most popular television shows right now are these talent shows. And there's all, they're all over the place. It started kind of with America's Got Talent, remember, and Simon. Simon Cowell, he always wears black like the devil. Right? And, uh, and, and then, you know, we, now Kelly and I got into this, uh, this is the voice. Anybody ever watch the voice and they have the red chairs and they turn around? And, uh, and then you've got the baking contest shows and, and you've got, there's one we, I saw that's called Forged in Fire. Colton, you like this one, right? And these dudes are making knives and they get like a challenge and they got to make the knife and there's just, oh, there's so many really cool, there's dancing Oh, you know, competitions on TV. There's uh, stand-up comedian competitions. There's magic show competitions. It's like the, the televisions are just inundated with these competition shows. Um, what do these shows have in common? They have two things in common. One, they have contestants. And the next, they have the talent show judge. Now, the contestants are all people who are pretty talented, whatever they do. If you're baking cupcakes or whatever, you're super good at it, I guess. And so you're on that show or if you're a singer, or whatever it is, they all have this belief and this feeling that they're good. They have something to give the world. Now, they know it. Mom and dad, grandma has come to their recitals. They've been told their whole life, many of them sang in church or whatever, and they've been told, oh, you are talented, you're so good. So they already know they're good, but it ain't good enough. I gotta have Simon tell me I'm good, or I've gotta have the talent show judge. And so th they all have this in common. They all know that they're good. They have these talents, but they need to be validated. They want the recognition, the success that comes with more people knowing that I'm good. You with me? All of the shows have that in common. <laughs> the second thing they have in common is they've got a table or whatever, and they've got these talent show judges. And these are the so-called experts that sit behind with their clipboard or whatever and they're judging, and person after person will come up, and they either say, oh, well done. That was great. Oh, you blew us away. You move on to the next or whatever. Or they say, thanks for trying. Thanks for coming. You're not good enough. And so then you have to walk off the stage in despair because grandma told you you were killer, but Simon told you you were lame. And so you feel horrible, and then you got to watch the rest of the show or the rest of the season, and you get to celebrate with the person who was way better than you. You guys with me here? Okay, this is what these shows have. Um, and I, I think to myself, why would anybody subject themselves to that? But we do. We do. 1981, middle school, East Avenue Middle School in Livermore, California, I went into a talent show and someone dared me to do it. And so I sang Bruce Springsteen's Born to Run. I was awesome. And I got up there in front of all my peers and the little, the teachers were the talent show judges. And I even struck the pose. Baby, I was born to run. And I'm going through puberty and, and my voice is awesome. All my friends are laughing their heads off, you know? And I had practiced in front of the mirror, man. I had the mullet, dude. I was awesome. And I left dejected. Not good enough. Why would anybody subject themselves to that? And then here's the question for today. Why do Christians subject ourselves to this? Why do we build this concept of God in our mind that he's up there behind some eight-foot table with a clipboard like he's the major talent show judge? Judging, well, Michael, 
You know, here's the word I always hear whispered into my ear. And I don't know about you, but, but if you're like me, this is the word. It's this, ready? More. More. I need more from you, Michael. Well, Lord, I prayed for, I prayed for you know, four minutes today. Yeah, we're going to need more. We're going to need more. You ever, you ever go to church and it's like you leave and you're, that's kind of what you feel like the sermon was about. Like, ah, God needs more. I need to read the Bible more. I need to pray more. I need to go to church more. I need more. God needs more, 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 more. You guys with me? Anybody else ever feel like that? I'm the preacher and I feel like that. And, and, and I don't mean to do that, but it's almost like whatever you do, not good enough, keep working. Keep going. And it, it creeps this more. It creeps into every aspect of our, of our lives, our spiritual lives, right? Of course. You know, have you, what books are you reading? Are you reading Christian books, Michael? We need more Christian books. Okay. Just finished a Louis L'Amour book. I thought that was pretty good. <laughs> Some of you are like, Louis L'Amour, what? <laughs> you know, I just finished binge watching a Netflix show. Really? It wasn't The Chosen? Well, if you're not watching Chosen, are you a Christian? You sure you're going to go to heaven? Listen, by the way, commercial real quick, Chosen is awesome. Everybody should watch it. It is really, really good. I really love it. But you, you guys know what I'm saying, right? It's like it's always more. It creeps into spiritually. You got to be doing this. It can creep into your life parentally. You know, you go, you talk to other people, and it's like, man, they're such good parents, man. I am so lame. You know, like I need to do more. You know, well, if God had your children, how would he be raising them? Are you doing it exactly like God would do it? No. I let them binge watch a show on Netflix. <laughs> More. When, when, when we are, are constantly hearing that whisper in our heart, More, you, I need more from you. I need more from you. I think there's an issue. This is how I usually uh, would try to solve it, is I would just get busier and busier and busier. I thought the more I did, the more I was doing, the more I could be uh, making God proud of me, the more I could gain his approval, the more I could impress him. Does that make sense? Because he's the talent show judge. He's back there going, okay, what did you do today? Well, I remember when I uh, first finally got out of college seminary and I became a youth pastor and um, dude, I was like, I'm going to be the best youth pastor in the world. So we, at six o'clock in the morning, we're going to have prayer every single morning. Kids could come to pray before school. And so we open it up and there's like one girl every day would show up for prayer. Maybe two people, but usually it was that one stinking girl that loved Jesus way too much. <laughs> so it was all awesome for about four days. And then I'm just like, dang, this girl, like, can you not come? You know, why did I start this ministry? And then it was like, oh, our door's always open, man. Come and hang out at our house. And so Kelly and I are doing people, kids would come to our house and stay till midnight. And I'd be like, dang, that stinking Christian girl's going to be here to pray in the morning. <laughs> and it's one. And then I'm at people's house, and, and they're like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm, uh, uh, we, our fence fell down in the backyard. So I'm like, oh, Kelly, I'm going to go help them build their fence. I'm going to build a relationship for ministry. So I'm out there building fences with people. And, and then I'm studying every spare moment I have to, so that I don't sound like an idiot when I'm talking to these kids. And, and then I get people asking me questions. Well, what do you think about pre-tribulation -tribul pre rapture? And, and what do you feel about, you know, was Jesus, you know all these questions, and I'm like, I, I went to college, but I don't even know what you're talking about. So then I'd go home, and I'd study all this doctrinal stuff, so I knew what I was talking about, and, and I was busy, dude. I'm telling you, I was exhausted, exhausted, and I'm doing all this stuff because I need to make God happy, and I'm trying to do ministry and, and everything. No rest in my life, just killing myself. You guys you understand what I'm saying? So I thought busyness equaled holiness, Busyness meant that I was going to be impressing God more. I want to read to you two scriptures, and I know people have a problem sometimes with, you know, different translations, but I'm going to read to you these scriptures in a, a translation called The Message, and because uh, and I, I just think it's so clear, and I want you guys to hear this. The first one is Hosea chapter 6, verse 6. God says, I'm after love that lasts, not more religion. I want you to know God not go to more prayer meetings. Isn't that good? Psalm, David writes in Psalm chapter 51, verse 16 and 17, going, I love this, going through the motions doesn't please you, God. 
A flawless performance is nothing to you. I learned God worship when my pride was shattered. Heart shattered lives, ready for love, don't for a moment escape God's notice. You probably recognize that a broken and a contrite heart, the Lord your God does not despise. But I like how that's written. I learned God worship when my pride was shattered. Heart shattered lives, ready for love, don't for a moment escape God's notice. Isn't that good? Man, I kind of don't think it's a fine line. I think it's a huge Grand Canyon-sized gap that separates being pleasing and performing. It's not a fine line. It's a big deal. Pleasing the Lord has to do with a, a relationship that's all about delight. I delight in the Lord, and he delights in me, and that's pleasing. Does that make sense? It's just, I'm just delighting in you. I just love you, God. I just want to be with you. And he's like, Michael, you're so weird, but I love you too. It's this delight, this pleasing relationship. Performing is all wrapped up in, I must impress you. I have to, I have all these responsibilities that I have to do. And I say this quite often, but I'm going to say it again. It's not responsibility, it's response. The things that we do, we go to church, we read the Bible, we pray. They're not our responsibilities. Got to get it done today. No, no, it's my response because he gave his one and only son. He loves me more than anything. How do I respond? I just love him back. With me? It's a big deal. It's a big deal. When we lose that sense of delight, and please get this, we're, if we're in the performance mode, and we've lost the sense of God delights in you and delights in me. When we lose that, we get exhausted. And when we get exhausted, and I've seen it many, many times, we throw in the towel and we give up. People walk away from religion. Well, I tried all that and I didn't, you know, I just, it didn't work for me and I tried it. And I always say, well, you didn't try Jesus then. You might've tried church and religion, but taste and see that the Lord is good. Not taste and see that the Alpine Chapel is good or whatever church you go to back home. Because those will get boring. Pastors will get lame. Worship will get on your nerves, whatever. Until you and I get into that delight relationship with the Lord. Because when it's there, we're just responding and he's responding to us. There's this close relationship. We're not viewing him as a talent show judge that we're trying to impress all the time. But we're delighting in our relationship with him. We don't get exhausted because when you're exhausted, gang, you throw in the towel. And, and I'm not saying you're going to go to hell. I'm not saying that. I'm saying your love waxes cold, as the King James says. It grows cold. And you're not passionate anymore. And you don't feel that anymore. And, and if, you're, if you're in that place at all, you're listening to me right now, and you're like, yeah, it's kinda, you're kind of describing my spiritual life right now, Michael, then, then just do a heart check and say, God, if I gotten into this performance mode, or if I forgot, because we're quick to put on the bumper stickers, it's about relationship and not religion. But as soon as we lose the intimate, listen, Abraham stepped forward. He drew near to the Lord. And the Lord is able to have this conversation with him where Abraham's incredibly bold. You know what that's called? It's called relationship. It's conversation. It's communion. But when did it start? When Abraham stepped it up. And he stepped forward in intimacy with the Lord. I love that. So I'm going to conclude with this. I've got three minutes. The talent show judge. Behind the table, that eight-foot table or whatever it is at my stinking middle school where they didn't like me, or whatever the talent show judge where they're sitting, let me tell you who's behind the table because it's not who you think. It ain't God. Behind the table, sitting there with the clipboard, judging, is you, and it's me. It ain't God. It is us that think, in our stupid minds, for some reason, we think that we're out there and we have to gain everybody else's, even his, approval. I'm telling you, gang, God delights in you. God's not behind the table. He's out in the audience cheering us on. You ever watch these shows, The Voice or America's Got Talent, and you get someone up there, and God bless them, man, they ain't good. 
You've seen it, right? Because there'd be someone who just smokes, they're just killer. And then there's someone up there like, you know, and, you, and then and you see the judges and they're brutal. They're just brutal to them. But usually not the audience. Because the audience feels bad for them. They're like, oh, it was really good. You know, it was really awesome, you know. And that's that's God. God's in the audience. And even when I ain't perfect and when I mess up, God is cheering me on. Michael, don't give up. Hebrews chapter 12, which by the way, just for people that want to know, follows chapter 11. <laughs> Super cool how that works, number, number wise. Last week, we talked about chapter 11 of Hebrews. It's the hall of faith. All these people, Gideon and Sarah, Moses, all these people that are like radical people of faith that just changed the whole world, turned it upside down. Then you get to 12, and the first verse in chapter 12 says something like this, therefore, it starts out, therefore. Whenever you see therefore, you're supposed to find out what it's there for. It's therefore because it ties in the whole thing of the faith chapter, and it brings you into chapter 12. He says, therefore, since all these people are awesome, please understand, Michael's translation, please understand, you have a great cloud of witnesses surrounding you cheering you on. I picture it like a race and like one of those marathons where they got the ribbon at the end and there's all the people and they're like, yeah, and they're, they're totally screaming and clapping and the people are like ready to barf and they're running, they're trying to get through the finish line and they're going, go, oh, you can do it, you can do it. Have you ever seen the people and they're just like, they're trying to get across and, and everyone's like, come on, they're cheering them on. That's how I picture Hebrews chapter 12, verse one and two. I picture like Gideon and Abraham and David and all the people that are mentioned in the Hall of Faith, I picture them as the great cloud of witnesses going, Michael, don't give up, man. You got this. Yeah, but you don't understand. It's really wicked where I live and where all these people are, they're mean. And, God, and the, the cloud of witnesses is going, come on, dude, you got this. Don't give up. You went the whole stinking race. Don't give up here at the end. Let's go, let's go, let's go. And I'm telling you, the greatest cheer in the audience is God. He is cheering you on, man. He wants you to win. He wants you to finish this race well and receive the crown of glory for his name's sake. Amen? Amen. This is what it's about, man. We gather together, remind ourselves, and fall back in love with this God who is not a talent show judge. He's in the audience cheering us on. Amen? Let's pray. Father, I love you so much. Thank you for uh, this time today to sing and worship your awesome name, to study the word, and be reminded of your character, your grace. Be reminded, Lord, that we can step forward, draw near to you. How cool is that, Lord? That we can have relationship with you. And Lord, all the things that are smart to do, the disciplines of faith, prayer and study and all those things, fasting, they're not responsibilities, God, but they're our response to a God who is head over heels in love with us. And Lord, today we just say we love you back. We love you back. Thank you for loving us when we're not perfect and our voices crack. <laughs> Thank you for being in our corner and cheering us on, God. Today, may we be men and women who are radical for you in every aspect of our lives because we have fallen in love with you. And I pray that for every person here, God, and I also pray that you would bless them this week, God. Some are going home they're going away, Lord, for the off season or whatever. God, bless them. Keep them. Protect them, God. Keep them in your presence close. In Jesus' name, I pray that, God. Keep them. Bless them. Keep them. May your face shine on them and through them to the worlds that they live in, God, their children, their, God, that they would share the things that you're speaking to them, especially with their children, their grandchildren, God. Just shine on them, shine through them, be gracious to them, lift up your countenance upon them and give to each and every person listening to me now your shalom, your peace that passes understanding in the name of the Father and the Son and the Spirit we pray, amen. Mm -hmm.